I should have. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to a history of basketball in 15 sneakers, the podcast show. Uh, we are here at Grind City Media in the Built for a Tough studio here in Memphis. I'm Lane Whitaker. That's my guy, Russ Bankson. And we are on chapter eight. Russ wrote this book, A History of Basketball in 15 Sneakers. That's out now. That's the history of basketball and sneakers and how they intertwine and interconnect. And we're into the 80s. I guess we're into the 90s now. Well, we're into the 80s. We're into the late 80s. Yeah, because we just did chapter seven was the Air Jordan 1. Chapter eight is the Reebok pump. And I, I mean, I guess the pump to me is more known for the D, most known for the D Brown dunk contest, but um, it was also used in a lot of other applications. We have here one of the pump tennis shoes. This is the Michael Chang shoe, Russ pointed out. Um, but the pump was the pump was really, I, I guess, at the end of the day, the pump's really a story of technology and somebody trying to to step on Nike's toes a little bit at the time. A little bit, yeah. I mean, it's air somewhere else, right? I mean, yeah. it, you don't have air under the feet, so you can have air like around and the and foot. And you can control it. It's like and it's like I mean, you should definitely like hold up that like just like that original basketball shoe was such a gigantic yeah like boot. You yeah. know, I mean, you have all these like, you talk about Air Jordan 1 being lightweight, low to the ground, simple. And then you have this shoe with that big plastic heel counter. You know, the 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 tongue was like a cow tongue. The release like valve giant on thing. the heel. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the actual pump itself yeah. going like not only in the tongue, but in separate bladders like around the foot. Yeah. Like on the sides. Of yeah. The, I yeah. mean, it, and it was, it was like a custom fit, you know, and it's like. On the one hand, you talk about it being like good for a kid's shoe because like or or like if you're in high school or whatever because yeah. your foot's growing so fast, you yeah. can buy a size smaller and whatever else. But then again, you're paying $170 yeah. for it. You could just buy two pairs of shoes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we just talked about the – I mean, this shoe came out in 89. The, the Jordan 1 came out in 84, 85, and, and that shoe was $75, I think, at retail. 65, 65. The Jordan was. Yeah. So – Four years later, a shoe comes out that's a hundred dollars more. Like it, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. That's not just inflation. That's just like a lot more. Right. Money. No. And the, and the Air Jordan that would have been like Air Jordan Four around yeah. that time in '89, and that's like a hundred bucks. Yeah. So it's like, and that's being sold as like obviously the best shoe for the best guy. So it's like, you know, the pump was kind of its own thing. It was like a technological, yeah, shoe. And like certainly, again, like. Nike with air was something you could feel and not only you could feel but something you could actually manipulate. Yeah. Um you know, initially they had there was a pump and they they did eventually do something like that where like walking on it would pump it. Yeah. You know, it would sort of self-inflate. That feels like a Rube Goldberg invention or something. Kinda, yeah, <laughs> you know, like yeah, something yeah. like yeah, the more you walk, the more it'll inflate. Like so how a do you fireplace bellows. Do you deflate it by like <laughs> sitting? Like I don't like the whole thing I don't think that would work. It, I mean it never came out, so maybe that's why it didn't. But no, they did eventually do something like that where I think like it did have an actual physical release and yeah. I'm sure it could only pump up so much because yeah. otherwise it would like explode. Yeah, or yeah. squeeze yeah. your foot off. <laughs> um but the actual pump mechanism was something that like people wanted to use. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, the pump was very interactive and it was fun. I mean, we should talk about the, at the same time Nike had a pump shoe. Yeah. Um, so like clearly the technology wasn't something that was proprietary to Adidas. I mean, it's it's a simple idea, right? It was like a parallel evolution. Yeah. Like they both wanted to do that. Proprietary to Reebok, I should say. It was, I mean, the idea was floating around clearly and they've been trying to figure out how to do it. I had a pair of the Nike ones, and um, they had like a, a separate pump. You had to right. attach. It was like a you know a pump you use on a basketball or something, but it had like a thing you squeezed. Yeah, and they were so expensive. I had my parents would buy me like two or three pairs of shoes a year, and they would pay fifty dollars. Anything above that, I had to pay for it. And I really wanted a pair. I was already into Nike, and I really wanted a pair of those. And I bought a pair of those shoes for like $180 oh, or something. And they idea. were terrible Poor shoes. Poor investment. No, they were awful. I probably wore them 12 times. And, you know, they did not – they probably made me a worse basketball player because they, <laughs> they were heavy and, like, you couldn't run in them and they didn't help you jump or anything. And I, I, I probably should have gotten the Reebok pumps. However – even the first Reebok pumps, like you said, were huge. And in yeah. reading your book, I read like 
they worked with this company and sort of it, somewhere along the lines, a ski boot was talked about as right. the inspiration for right. that original one. Like, like we saw in the book. Yeah. And, I mean, you, you know, you, they talked about a ski boot. It was, uh, this company design continuum that yeah. was doing like blood pressure cuffs and yeah. IV bags and like all these different like medical um, devices or I devices, guess, yeah. but also things that obviously were very tough and wouldn't pop. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like a ski boot. Yeah. You need it to fit like that. I think it was a lessay. Yeah. Who had done the ski boot, but they did like you know, tennis and ski, a ski boots, like a hard plastic boot or yeah. a, or a stiff leather boot. Where like that goes to your knee. Yeah, and and <laughs> yeah. like you're not trying to flex it. Yeah, and you just want it to. You literally want it to to not allow you. Can't you can't have to like move. a molded plastic right next to your foot, so you need something in yeah. there to fill that gap. You know, I think pump the shoe is different because like you're dealing with, especially with Reebok, like kind of a garment soft leather. Yeah. You know, and then you want to inflate it. But then you also need it to flex. Like you can't have your ankle just locked in. Yeah. And I think they even realize like also the price point being so insanely expensive. Yeah. You know, you went to the next generation of pump. $170. And that's when you get into Shaq and that's when you get into D Brown with the Omni Zone. Yeah. You know, they kind of realize like we need to simplify this. Yeah. So eventually like. In There's the Shaq. Yeah, which was a great. I mean, I think the Shack Attack looked really cool. Yeah, I mean they've brought that back a few times now. You had that combination of like that shiny. I don't. know, It's not really patent, but whatever that is, like on the mylar ankle. Or it's yeah, like a balloon. But then like kind of a textured like black where that thing went, and the plastic lace loops, and then like on the inside it was really cut away. Um, I don't know. To me, that was like Shaq's probably his best looking shoe. The magic, the, the magic colors were so cool too. Like, the, you know, yeah, like that's pretty fun. Yeah, like and, and I mean the pumps, the pump like was limited then to the tongue, with like a wing that went to the side of the yeah. foot a little bit. So it was simpler. Yeah, they were able to keep it less expensive. Um, you know, you have D Brown, famously yeah. pumping his shoe yeah. up at the dunk contest. He ended up doing that cover his eyes dunk. He initially wanted to wear a pump. <laughs> like baseball cap and pull it down over his eyes, but the NBA wouldn't let him do it because they used to have a rule against like any props yeah. and certainly any like um, baseball caps. Well, probably baseball caps, <laughs> sure. but inflatable baseball headband. caps. Yeah. Um, do you still have Baron's uh, headband? I do with the yeah. eye holes yeah. not cut out in it. Shout out Baron Davis. <laughs> But D also like that became kind of an iconic thing where it's like you have the black shoe with the white laces. Yeah, you know yeah. I think like flipping. It laces felt like, like the like old that. Celtics thing too, though. Like you know, like the old Celtics Red from back the fifties and sixties. Yeah, would have recognized that. Yeah, but I kind of didn't realize, and that's kind of what I get at in the book a little bit is the year before. Yeah, Dominique Wilkins wore the original pump. Yeah. in a dunk contest. Yeah, and like we kind of mentioned, like the original pump weighed two hundred and fifty pounds. Yeah. Dominique wins the dunk contest wearing it in 1990. Um, I rewatched like at least his dunks from that contest, and he pumped his shoe up during it too. But no, it was really quick. No like, mention of it. He yeah. didn't really. He didn't really make a big show of it. Yeah. And the announcers didn't say anything, and they didn't even pan down. So like, Dominique almost did like a trial run of what D ended up doing. Yeah. But at that point, Dominique was already like a great dunker, though, and too. a multi yeah. dunk contest winner, right? Like, but I D mean, Brown sort of needed the gimmick. D was Do a rookie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dominique didn't need a gimmick. Like so, he was, someone, someone apparently saw D sitting there, like with Sean Kemp, and asked yeah. if he was Sean Kemp's son. Yeah, <laughs> which is funny because D, like, I don't think is that much older than Sean Kemp. Yeah, but uh, and then yeah, Michael Jordan accused him of starting his shoe wars like yeah. afterwards. Dominique, but, yeah. I, I so I grew up in Atlanta and Dominique was my favorite player and and like to me Dominique was a Brooks guy right like yep. Brooks was a, a running shoe company uh, but you mentioned Brooks earlier in the context of some other basketball thing I don't remember what it was but they they were mostly known for, or the your cleats you had you had a pair oh, of right. Brooks cleats Roger Staubach yeah, yeah, yeah but the the Brooks was a running shoe company and they somehow signed Dominique Wilkins and yep. you know the whole time Dominique. 
in the late 80s, was trying to like get the Hawks to the next level and you know can't get past the ceiling of Larry Bird and and then eventually Jordan comes along, the Pistons come along. Like right. the, Dominique and the Hawks could never quite get over that hump. And it sort of was fitting that Dominique had Brooks on because it was like, you know, the Hawks are second class citizens to these other teams, and Dominique's wearing this shoe that is not quite in that echelon yeah. of like the best. Well, and ones. what? Because Dominique was like the last guy to lead the league in scoring, I think, before Jordan did. Yeah. Then for the next like, yeah, however many years. But then he went to the pumps, and it was sort of like it was 1990. You send the dunk contest, and you know, two years later, he's traded to the Clippers. Oof. So like, it, it wasn't. It was kind of at the end, like when Dominique started, like kind of. I, I guess he was more mainstream, and and Reebok. I think for Reebok, at that time, like they were a, an aerobics shoe. They company. were. I mean, they did those aerobics shoes. They did the princess. They did the uh, the workout and the exofit, and like it was this garment leather that yeah. was like too soft for sneakers, really. Yeah. But people were super psyched on them, like yeah, and that was like a you know. One a rare sort of Phil Knight Nike misstep where they looked at those shoes and were like, "No, we're not doing this," and Reebok really ate into yeah. their market share. And aerobics, like, I don't think people remember how popular aerobics, aerobics were. Huge. <laughs> Jane Fonda had like these videotapes that were like the number one thing on the market. There's movies would, made about aerobics. John I would, Travolta. I, I would love to have some that leg warmer money. <laughs> John Travolta made a movie about aerobics with Him Jamie Lee Curtis. Jordan, John, no, right? there's oh, one with Jamie Lee Curtis. Curtis remember. Uh, Vaguely. But anyway, the, the aerobics were huge, and Reebok really cornered that market. And then, I mean, they did get involved in basketball. And yeah. um, Joanna Olette Borzakian, like, she yeah. did a lot of the NBA stuff, and she came from Boston. Like, she would, she was sitting baseline, like, with her dad at Celtics games and kind of sold people on Reebok, and literally players one at a time, you know? Like, one of those things where... Players are coming through the layup line. Yeah. And she would like ask them, like, do you have a shoe deal? Yeah. You're know, like super, like beyond grassroots. And it's like you had eventually Danny Ainge, who had been a Nike guy. I think DJ was a Nike guy too. And yep. they both end up switching into Reebok. Yeah. And Reebok's early basketball shoes, they did, I mean, super creative the 4600, yeah. the 5600, and the 6600. Yeah. And they were all like, same thing garment leather. So super soft, yeah. essentially pre-broken in. I remember the big branding. The Celtics wearing the like the black one. All those Celtics guys wearing yep. the black ones with the white, the thing. big white, yeah, the white stripes around. Yeah, it. like and kind of the a logo. backward seven. Yeah. And, like it's and they actually look just like some fashion company put out some shoes like three years ago, four years ago. It might have been Dior or somebody like that or Balenciaga. Someone ripped that off. Somebody yeah. just totally ripped it off. And I don't know if people realize that it was just a copy of the old Reeboks. And I think even then. Like LA Gear, I think, ripped off yeah. that one shoe. Like, the, yeah. I think the 5600, which is the one they wore. The 6600, like, I don't think a lot of pros wore it, I don't but it was that. like, it was their super expensive shoe. I, Pete Maravich wore them when he played on the Celtics right at the end of his career. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. I remember I Pete Maravich wearing that. them. Yeah. Uh, with the 5600s. But they the got guys into like, they got like Northeastern University, they got yeah. some other schools in that area. Um, cause Reebok was based in Boston. Wayman yeah. Tisdale yeah. wore Reebok. He was an early guy, but Dominique was kind of like, yeah, Dominique was a sort of like their, their proof of existence. Yeah. You know, it's like they needed a star Yeah, and it's like, rather than go for the next Jordan and gamble yeah. on a young guy, not that Dominique wasn't, not that he was old. I mean, he, he was Couple he was years in a prime. traded. He yeah, was in I mean, his prime. I mean, it was before he got hurt. Yeah, I mean, if this is like 1990, and you know, Dominique was probably late 20, 29, 30, yeah, 28, maybe a, maybe somewhere in there. Yeah, I mean, he's still entering dunk contests. So, yeah. like, yeah, yeah, you know, he's still young enough, and it's like he was kind of their first star level player. Yeah, you know, and I think like not only did Dominique kind of validate the pump because the other guys wearing it were like Byron Scott. Yeah. You know, like sort of not super lower level, but not quite yeah. all pro. Role players. But Dominique kind of led them into Shaq. Yeah. Yeah. Who then leads them into Iverson, you yeah. know, who like really got Reebok into when they were at their peak. Is, but, Sha is Shaq like the ultimate case study in big men don't sell shoes? You know, I think like. 
I feel like Shaq wanted to be the first big men sell everything. Yeah. You know, and and <laughs> insurance. I, I don't Insur- want to like, you know, David Falk, like, I feel like would speak differently about Shaq if he represented Shaq. Yeah. But, you know, he, the one thing he said that kind of did resonate is like Shaq was trying to be all these different things. Like yeah. Shaq's trying to be like the giant ogre, like yeah. smash everything, but also being the guy in that Pepsi commercial yeah. with the little kid when he gave him the yeah. thing or whatever. And, he's and, like, and the friendly genie in the yeah, movies. Yeah, and a rapper. Yep. Um, shout out to Fushnickens. Shaq said, told me that he had two albums go platinum, two go gold, and two went wood. <laughs> I think he didn't. He also say like I think I asked him about this and like his whole thing about rapping wasn't necessarily to be a great rapper. Like he just wanted to like yeah. rap with his favorite artists. Yeah, just to meet those. So guys. he could do it. Yeah, yeah. Like, he did a song with Biggie. Biggie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like Shaq, Shaq was insane. And but to my question, like you know, we've always heard forever, big men don't sell shoes. Whether that's true or not, that's always been like the phrase that gets thrown around. It's right. kind of glib and easy to think about. But like, if anybody would sell shoes that's a big man, it would probably be Shaq. You would think, yeah. just the personality. I mean, he sold insurance and you know, iced tea and everything else in the world. Why couldn't he sell shoes? And- I mean, I think my thing is, and like kind of the way I said it in the book was like, it's not big men can't sell shoes. It's just big men shoes don't sell. Yeah, and like you had all these shoes, and like you look at some of Shaq stuff, and like. The Shaq Gnosis, the one with like yeah, all the, the concentric circles on yeah. it, like it was cool, kind of. Yeah. But it's like everything was trying to compete at that point with Air Jordan being established and being this sleek, like yeah. sort of Euro looking kind of thing. And if you're designing shoes for a guy who's 7'2 and 350 or whatever 305 or <laughs> whatever he was back then, it's like you're kind of limited. Like you need these things to be kind of brolic. Yeah. You know, and I think the pump certainly was they made some sleeker ones did you say brolic i did say brolic i love that word um yeah no i know what you mean like the the pumps i mean it wasn't until the omni zone ones the d brown ones that the pump felt like it was like sort of approachable you know like the yeah. old ones were like the ski yeah. boots and that was the first one and i guess in some ways this one is a little bit like that too the the tennis one here with the ball on it like all of a sudden they felt like, oh, this isn't going to weigh a million pounds and I can wear this and, you know, run to the grocery store or something like that. Right. Like, and, was- and they went the opposite way, too, because like and I meant to get into that more in the book. Actually, that's another minor regret is like Reebok did that whole black top series. Yeah. Which was like a street ball shoe, yeah. but with a pump, too. So it's like you have the pump, which is heavy. And then you're adding like outdoor yeah, like- durometer rubber. Yeah. I can't believe I said durometer. <laughs> but. You know, it's like you're armoring what's already a big shoe and like, oh my God, like those things were massive. Yeah. You know, but Nike had the Air Raid and it's like, oh, we got to do these outdoor shoes, which in hindsight is hilarious because any of these like 80s and 90s shoes, you probably could have played outdoors in. You mentioned in here, um, wrapping this chapter up, you mentioned also in this chapter about the Dream Team in Barcelona and, and Shaq not getting an invite to that team. Um, coming out of college, you know, I, I did a story for GQ a couple of years ago, uh, the oral history of that dream team. And I interviewed 40 something people involved with that team. And PJ Carlissimo was one of the assistant coaches. And I asked him about it. And, you know, there was these conspiracy theories that it was cause he was not with Nike. Shaq was not. Oh, okay. But PJ Carlissimo was like, people forget like Christian Leitner has arguably the greatest resume of any college player ever. And I was like, all right, like, I mean, sure. But Shaq was Shaq. Like, you know, like he was already, like we knew Shaq was a salesman and this incredible figure and all this stuff. Right. My only, I wonder, and I don't know. Yeah. But I feel like, A, it was probably easier to say to Christian Leitner, like, dude, yeah, congratulations on making the team. You're not playing. Yeah. You know, I think Shaq would have probably been a little upset about that. Yeah. And you already had Patrick Ewing and David Robinson. Yeah. So, and David Robinson was probably pretty upset still about 88. Yeah. So those guys were going to want to play. Um, and also, like, I wonder whether that factors into it or not. And I'm sure PJ wouldn't tell you. But, like, <laughs> you know, I feel like Leitner's game was probably made more sense for, like, international play. Yeah. Although at the time, like, it didn't matter. Conceivably shoot. You're the yeah, last guy on the matter. bench. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, like, the best stat about that is Chuck Daly didn't call a single timeout the entire Olympics. Yeah. 
Yeah. And as I told someone on Twitter, those bespoke suits weren't going to measure themselves. <laughs> um, all right. Well, that that's the Reebok pump, which uh, changed a lot of things in the shoe game and in the dunk contest and everything else. Um, you talked about the Dream Team and all that. Um, there's also a, a player in the next chapter that we're going to get to who was on the Dream Team. and He had, may or may not have led the Dream Team in scoring. He might have been the best player on the Dream Team. Um, and uh, But we'll talk about some other things and sneakers and bad boys and all this in this next chapter uh, when we get to Chapter 9. But that was Chapter 8. He's Russ. I'm Lang. Join us again for Chapter 9 in a couple days, and uh, we'll see you soon back here on Grind City Media. If you're looking for even more sneaker culture content, check out the Sneak Fest show with me, Kelsey Ray Johnson, Sherman, Adam, and Jerry, live every Tuesday at 2 p.m. on Grind City Media YouTube and the brand new Grind City Media app.